below zero. Celsius, of course, but... Uh, yeah, fair, yes, yes. <laughs> we Americans uh, aren't so good at converting, but uh, uh, I, I know kilometers quite well, <laughs> less, less so fluent in uh, temperature. Hmm. Well, great. Hello, hello. Hi, Val. How are you? Hey, how are you guys? Good to see you guys. Yeah, oh, uh... Is today a holiday in the U.S.? Yes. It's been so quiet. I got so much <laughs> work done. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I think we just, uh, John and I just finished up an all-day meeting with the company that was working today. I was kind of, I thought it was a mistake, but they, uh, yeah, this was a work day for them. So, Paul, did you notice how many folks signed up for this meeting? I checked a few um, hours ago with 65 on Meetup, and there's, I think, another 20 on the Google invite I have. So, uh, I mean, we, we usually end up getting 40 to 60. Uh -huh. So, I mean, it is a holiday. Maybe, maybe it'll be 40-ish. Good morning, Adam. Hey, Danny. Let's uh let's start doing a few minute a uh, few intros. So uh, how about um Alex Coro? You want to say hello, Alex? Hey, Hi, John. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone some technical difficulties nice meeting you all i'm participating in those meeting for quite some time was it induced by david owen uh, enjoying it so far well great primary learning from your guys experience and seeing how can i implement it to my new role product management around ai and machine learning well, great well welcome alex alex minus where are you calling from i'm in the boston area Oh, okay. Oh, the local guy. Great. Well, thank you. Well, welcome. Uh, let's do a few more. Uh, how about JP? J P. You want to introduce yourself? Hey. hey, what's going on? I'm calling from Canada. I'm just on the train, so I apologize if it's not coming through. Yeah. Um, joined the group a while back, but I haven't had a chance to join in some of the other sessions. So thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm just here to you know learn from you guys, and I uh, saw the topic today, so I was really interested. So uh, yeah, that's about it about me. Welcome, Jay. So dedicated a listener calling in from the train. We love it. <laughs> so uh, how about a few more? Uh, Ron Grubb, you want to introduce yourself and say hi? Ron, I think it's still, uh, there you go. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, I got a little background light today. Uh, it's sunny and warm here in California. Uh, 60 <laughs> degrees, went out walking by the ocean. So uh not uh, not uh, missing my time back in Indiana for sure, uh, but like so always, I like to touch. I like to join in and 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 see if how much I can learn. Um, this is affecting law uh, in a big way. Uh, everyone seems to be real nervous about it. Um, so the more you know, the uh, the better you are, I guess. <laughs> hey Ron, where in California do you live? I'm in Alameda. We're right mm -hmm. off of, uh, we're in between Oakland and San Francisco. Um, but, um, I mean, it's 60 degrees here all year round. So <laughs> it's take the good with the bad. Hey, Ron, sorry to interrupt. I'm also in Alameda. Woohoo. I'll, I'll hit you up in chat. <laughs> yes, please do. Well, that's great. People connecting, uh, so how about a few other folks? Oh, Liz Vanzura, welcome. Liz, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Paul. Hi, Liz. How are you guys doing? Good. Tell me about who you are. We've got a, quite a crew joining tonight. Okay. So um, I'm actually an advertising and marketing specialist. I work with GAI Insights as well. And I run a CMO learning lab, um, but mostly I'm right now an advertising consultant for various CPG brands and um, teach a personal branding class as well. Well, great. And I love GAI Insights because 
uh, met Paul and team doing this and keep up on all the latest or try. <laughs> and Liz, Liz is the one that said, this is like having a thousand interns at your fingertips. And I've used that phrase hundreds of times since last February. So uh, I want to put note that. Um, well, great. Well, welcome. Liz. Let's do a few more. Uh, Carrie, Carrie Poo, you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. So, um, Ron, I'm actually neighbors. <laughs> I'm also from the Bay Area. So, hi, everyone. Sunny. Yes, it is here always in California. Uh, I teach chemistry. So, um, when ChatGPT first came out last summer, I was really struggling grading the my final project. So I love to learn more about how to teach the students using AI as tools and not not to cheat, but yeah. to help them, you know, learn better. So thank you guys. I haven't been able to join you guys for a while, so it's great to see you again, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for coming back. Well, great. Well, let's uh, let's do one more. Adam down under. You want to say good morning? Yeah, sure, Paul. Uh, although I'm from the states, I'll say good day, mate. Right? They've taught <laughs> me properly. Um, howdy, everyone. I'm an East Coast, West Coast, now down South transplant, born outside Boston. Um, so I know a lot of that area well, as well as I lived in Silicon Valley and San Francisco Bay Area for a decade before Seattle. Um, yeah, I'm right into this stuff. I was hands on the tools December 22 when uh, ChatGPT came out, but I've been working with Bayesian networks, weighted algorithms for uh, since since about 2000. So uh, familiar with machine learning, but some of this large language model stuff is new and very exciting. Um, I'm an educator, I'm a mentor, I'm a guide, I'm uh, available for advisory consulting services and uh, love to help at the individual and at the uh, enterprise level wherever I can. That's fantastic. Well, Adam, great to see you. And let's do one more, Jeff Tratner. Jeff, I'm down in Atlanta. You must be eating cold at Cleveland. I, we I, honestly, we, we crossed paths on the 470. Um, but yeah, it's about three degrees up here. Uh, how could I not attend? I got called out by Bob Manchin for not having my GPTs in the store. So I got to show up, learn a little bit more. And I'm a lot like Liz, just trying to keep up. Uh, yeah. It's a great group. Uh, good to see a couple of names on here that I follow during your um, 7.30 a.m. everyday morning briefings, which really I try to hit, but it's very hard. You guys are doing a great job. So thanks for everything you do. Oh, well, good. Well, thanks, Jeff, for the kind words. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, uh, let me click over to the right screen. So this is a, our learning lab for uh, folks. Uh, this is put on by GAI Insights. We're a company in Boston that's an industry analyst and uh, helping companies figure out how to use this amazing technology for a business, uh, business advantage. Uh, we believe a lot in community and have an annual conference, do these weekly calls, have daily calls around the top news, bunch of research, and uh, do a lot of connecting with people. Uh, we currently have seven AI analysts, uh, and some of you folks are on the lines, which is wonderful, and we continue to uh, build up our ranks there. Um, uh, WINS framework uh, is something that John and I and Jimmy wrote for Harvard Business Review. We just used it again today with a customer. It's a great way to think about urgency uh, and risk for Gen AI, both at the industry level, the company level, and at the job level. Uh, and if you aren't familiar with it, let us know, but it's um, it's really effective way to figure out what type of industries and what type of jobs. Um, and it turns out, you know, the headline is, if you have uh, a type of work that the value is created using wins, words, images, numbers, or sound, uh, you have, and a lot of that's digitized, you have a lot of um, change coming your way. So we're seeing that in legal, uh, entertainment industry, uh, professional services, particularly insurance, um, education development, and others. Um, folks aren't aware, we got a buyer's guide we spent a lot of time last uh, year on. It's uh, doing quite well. It's quite comprehensive for folks who want to understand this, all the different uh, vendors out there, and it's an ever-changing thing. We'll probably uh, need to update it uh, probably uh, sometime in Q2. Uh, Jeff mentioned uh, one of the areas we're trying to do to help keep up is to uh, stay current on the news. And a uh, crazy idea we had, I think two or three months ago, was that our AI analysts meet every day at 7.30 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we have Ankaj and in India search internet for the top four or five enterprise Gen AI news items. And we rate them and debate them uh, for the time-starved AI executive, EIO. So E is essential reading. I is important and uh, O is optional. And uh, 
the real value is in the debate uh, and kind of hearing why some people think it's uh, important or some people think it's uh, uh, optional. Uh, we have an exciting uh, case study coming up at the end of uh, March or end of uh, it's two weeks now in um, using one of these uh, leading uh, no code solutions called Custom GPT. And uh, Doug Williams, who uh, runs a group um, at uh, MIT, is going to walk through how they are uh, really uh, automating some of their knowledge bases. And they're doing it for less than $500 a month to implement it in two weeks. And it's a great example of the type of um, value people can get out of these tools and not have to have a whole um, uh, set of uh, uh, design or data scientists on staff or uh, buying them through, um, uh, through an expensive consultant. Uh, a few other things. I'm just in Atlanta right now. We just finished up uh, AI Woodstock Atlanta. AI Woodstock is our fun and formal name. We had 10 or 12 here at the hotel bar. It was great to kind of meet some more people down here in Atlanta and uh, continue to uh, get the word out. We uh, continue to find um, real enjoyment, at least I do, in connecting people who are really enthusiastic. And there's a whole lot of interesting work going on at Georgia Tech and uh, with some of the uh, co big companies down here like Coke and others. Uh, a couple other events I have on your radar screen here in the Boston area. Uh, uh, April 4th, or April 8th, excuse me, is an all-day conference at MIT on uh, the future of business with AI. Uh, this was an unbe unbelievable conference last year where Sam Altman called in and we got Lex Friedman and um, Stephen Wolfram there uh, being interviewed. Uh, it is a free event, but you've got a why be accepted. So I think the registration is going up next week after Davos. So uh, keep that on your radar screen. Uh, there was about 600 people and I think, I don't know, 2000 uh, applied to, um, to attend. Uh, and then our conference is um, October in the fall, seven of eight. A uh, few other things. Um, one of the things we had in our last conference was Shakar Ghosh from Harvard Business School. And one of the things that he said, which was repeated a number of times at the conference was that he thought the app metaphor for Gen AI was is termites and not tornadoes. That business leaders aren't going to see you know this big tornado just blow the industry down or blow your business model. But in fact, if you don't respond, it will start eating away, and eventually <clears throat> the, um, you'll be at a significant disadvantage. Um, so it, this change is coming, and if you watch the paint uh, dry, you won't see it, but it is uh, is happening. And it's something that we're seeing in a lot of companies right now as they have really uh, budgeted now for Gen AI and really started thinking about the um, uh, the uh, implications for their business and for customer support uh, and for kind of differentiation. Um, and the way we run the meetings, we uh, after this intro here, we typically have a showcase. Uh, tonight, uh, Bob's going to walk through OpenAI. He's got a great presentation, kind of walking through what GPTs are, how they, uh, how to set one up, uh, what a store is. And then the last five or so minutes, we'll have open mic where uh, people can have a few minutes to share uh, what key things they're working on or um, uh, any key questions they want to have the group. So, Bob, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Bob, are you ready? You there? Yep, just there uh, navigating. Okay. We uh, see your screen now. Yep. Great. So uh, these annoying task bars are always in my way. Can't find a place for them. But uh, in any case, let me uh, hit the slideshow and uh, take it away. So as Paul said, my name is Bob Macklin. My uh, first day in the job here as part of uh, this group was actually March 6th. And uh, Adam was kind enough to spend 30 minutes with me at the end of it. And uh, two, day late, two days later, I'm signed up for the GPT um, plus version. So my enthusiasm is uh, what, 10, 11 months now getting there. Anyway, I'm a consultant um, focused at the operational level. So I get to try to understand the technology you know, deeper in order to help my customers and, and you know their processes and what they're all about. And um, as you might imagine, when uh, GPTs hit the market, uh, that was my signal to learn about them. So 
Last year was a blockbuster year for OpenAI in many regards. We all are familiar with number of customers, 100 million and so forth, uh, weekly average users. Uh, revenue run rate that was expected to be 200 million for the year ended at 1.6 billion. And there were actually 16 full product announcements last year. So every time you got to settle down, think you knew what it was about, next thing you know, there's something new. Uh, for me, the 4th of July uh, finale was uh, November 6th when they announced GPTs. And the reason is it included everything you see here and then a lot more, which I'm gonna show shortly. And by the way, I promise only have five slides here before you get to demos. Um, some notable quotables. So, there's quite a bit of folks out there that make a lot of noise of having challenges with them, particularly privacy and security stuff. But the reality is that they actually represent less than 2% of the users. So we're talking, there was 150,000 that are measured in the store. There's actually 3 million use, usages uh, as of the store announcement. And if you could tell by trying to get access, you know that number is probably four or even five million at this point. Um, a couple of folks, I wanted to put a quote, I've had several discussions with Connor. He was hoping to be here tonight, but bottom line, he gave me full endorsement to say what's appeared here. Um, he's actually, his use case is an onboarding document for new hires. And uh, he and I went back and forth. I gave him some pointers there and he's off and running at this point. Um, probably the most skilled prompter in LinkedIn is Ethan Mollick. Um, he published a document that I will put in links later. I have a full document, a Google Docs that has a bunch of links for you folks to the extent you want to follow up. But, you know, very similar to my reaction. First time you saw it back in mid-November is wow kind of thing. And uh, if you look at the statement there, that's pretty impactful, creating a GPT for every class. Um, so the next 15 to 20 minutes, I want to say what a, tell you what a GPT is, show you the store, show you some demos, and pending time, we can talk about teams. And I try to, I want to try to leave some time for those who have actually experienced building a GPT. And thank you to those that uh, submitted some questions. Um, roughly 85% of those who submitted questions said that he actually built a GPT, which was a little surprising to me, but that's great. So I'm gonna cover GPTs in one slide, okay? It's a lot here, but uh, we'll see how well I do. So the first concept I wanna get across is what I call a prompt bot. And the prompt bot is composed of two parts, the prompt and the bot. So in chat bots, the center of intelligence is either a flat file or a vector file, right? Center of knowledge. In the LLM world, it's the prompt, okay? Now what GPTs have introduced is the bot part. And the bot is short for robot which basically executes a set of instructions. And if you think about a chat bot, all of those instructions are executed by the creator of the application. You as a user basically have little to no control other than asking a question. Where the power lies and also is your enemy if you're not skilled at is in instructions. You can think of it as you are the control tower, tower and the pilot. And I'm gonna show more on the demo side, but at the very bottom of the screen, there's a question that I believe many that are complaining about it don't follow. They're simple questions, but what do you want it to do? How to behave? And what should it avoid doing? Okay, the last thing is very important to understand. Now I'm gonna, put these high level words to meanings when we get go forward in the demos. Trying to get my uh, slide thing here to move. There we go. Oops, there we go. So on the left-hand side of the slide, 
are the internal re resources. You're familiar with many of them already from the bottom to the top, DALI, text to image, code interpreter, both working with spreadsheets as well as code directly and back and forth. Um, if you have the skills in the course, GPT vision. What is unique in GPT with regard to those three and other resources that you can use them simultaneously, as opposed to kind of the independent actions, you can actually bring them together in a complex set of instructions. And the final one is actually new, and that's called a smart retriever. If you want a bit of understanding, it's in the links, but if you listen to Dev Day, which is a 45 minute presentation, it, it's pretty technical, but you'll get some insights to what they're doing there. Um, this is not exclamation point a rad. And I will show you via demos that you can prove to yourself why it's not a rad. The second set of resources is on the right-hand side. Um, I put web search and while it's an internal tool, it's part of a collection of tools for getting external access. So again, in a demo I will shortly do, you can, in addition to analyzing files, you can go out in the same set of instructions, go to the web and search for latest and greatest. I will show you how to search for trends in a particular topic, for example. Uh, there have been several comments about GPT plugins going away. And maybe they will, maybe they won't, don't know. But the advantage of to developers of moving over and what OpenAI says it takes you know, two to three minutes for the move is you go from 2K context windows to 128K. So 60 times the context window. And you can combine it with all the other things that you see here on the slide. At the very bottom of the slide, and I'll get to the dev environment in a second, um, OpenAI did a deal with a company called Zapier. They make 6,000 applications, and basically these are triggers and actions. If something happens, then do something else. I had a couple of questions. Uh, thank you, folks, that submitted questions, which is, how do I do X? And one of the Xs was, how do I upload my documents my Excel files to Google Sheets. Well, read the Zapier documentation or just go to YouTube and they'll show you how. On the OpenAI site, search Zapier, you'll see the announcement and they'll actually explain uh, there's a few steps, but the gist of it is that you're connecting Zapier to the API and then you can do automated things. I mentioned the Excel file. You can trigger things like calendar, email, Slack, there's a whole range of them, uh, quite popular platform. I've also heard Nicole Leffer uh, show how she goes from text to voice. So you type up a document, you want it to uh, come back to you in, in a sound file, that's how you do it. And the final area is in some ways not new, in some ways brand new, and that's uh, OpenAI app development environment. There's thousands of apps developed by companies to use the OpenAI environment. What is new is this new assistance API. Um, it's a very robust environment. Again, if you listen to um, the dev day, they'll, they'll actually show you further. Uh, I could spend a little bit of time on it. I think it's better that you listen to dev day and then go look at the documentation. So enough of tutorial, let's get to uh, some demos. And let me take a drink of water for a second. So I'm going to start with the screen that we all know, of course, was chat GPT. And we're going to go over here to the explore GPTs. And as you can see, it's changed from the pre-store date. You now have the store front and center. I'm going to give you a quick tour there. And then your own GPTs that you previously created are up on the right-hand side, my GPTs, and the plus create button. What is a pleasant surprise uh, for me versus plugins is that these are ordered by uh, sorted by functional area. So what they do is show featured, trending, 
those developed by chat GPT. And then if you look at the top, you'll see these other categories, writing, productivity, research analysis, and so forth. Um, one that I particular like is this app called Scholar AI. Now, rather than giving you a tutorial of it, let me 30 seconds describe it and then just show you a chat session I had with it over the weekend. Basically what it's doing is it's reaching out to 200 million uh, scientific research papers. The ones I like to research the most are AR, AI, AIRXIV, uh, basically archive uh, for short. Over in the left here, if I click on my chat, and by the way, this weekend, it was free. So basically took advantage of it. It's a freemium model. So you can see what I did here was ask about RAGS. Uh, then I wanted to know about vector databases. I wanted to get the latest research. So most of the questions have to do with 23 and 24. I uh, wanted to know about Mistral and then more specifically about 8 by 7 b because as Guido Appenzeller showed, Mistral is now the number two of all LLMs out there. So it is surpassed even Anthropic's uh, Claude at this point in terms of performance across a number of categories. Um, that is huge implications for those that want to start with open source and then fine tune it with their own uh, information. Let me move the, the bar out of the way again. So the next thing I wanna do um, is I'm gonna go build a GPT. And what I'm gonna use here is uh, information that I pre-created in the interest of time. So let's go back to chat GPT, go over to explore and go to create, all right? The left-hand side create is basically like a helping assistant. It itself is a GPT that OpenAI created. So if you actually want to see the instructions of them walking through what GPTs are all about, and more specifically, how they actually created this walkthrough, that's what this is. GPT Builder is literally an open AI one. Uh, for those that haven't used it, I typically, since the first one I created in November, I now go directly to the configure side, but let's start out with create in case there are any folks on this call that haven't used it before. So the question is, what would you like to make? So what I basically said um, is that I wanna create a GPT for public relations professionals for comparing two documents I'm gonna provide, an executive guide in a blog series on the topic of AI in public relations. So I'll do our typical copy paste. And again, I have to move this bar. I'll paste it and hit the return. By the way, if anyone can tell me how to get rid of the bar, that would be appreciated, but uh, we'll hold off. So what it's actually doing right now, it's actually building um, instructions and asking about, um, for example, what do you want to name it? So I'm going to name it uh, P, have a type of word, PR AI Assistant or GAI, okay? So now it's gonna go build it. It's gonna do a profile picture, which was impossible to do uh, the last several days because uh, folks were hitting the DALI server in a really big way, but uh, it looks like uh, it's working now. Do you like it? Sure, it's great. So, Instead of continuing on from here in terms of answering this question, let's go over to the configure side. And basically what happened here is it, based on the information I've provided thus far, 
It's built both instructions and conversation starters. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with that from the GPT plus. But I wanna make some modifications because when it did it last time, it didn't quite like its interpretation for the instruction. So I'm gonna start right here, copy paste. All I've done here is take what they did and cleaned it up. Nothing fancy, but uh, I didn't like what they did. So, all right. The next thing I wanna do is I wanna upload files to this, right? And I'm gonna, these are from my, sitting on my desk, desktop. If you look on the right-hand side, you'll see them directly. I'm gonna choose the guide and uh, the PR blogs. Those are the two documents. And I'll hit save. Uh, and anyone with a link. And again, I'll provide you links later. Now, the reason I, first of all, these are courtesy of my client, a company called Engage PR. Uh, these are public documents. If you went to their website, which will have a link, you can find the documents and sell. But one of the things I wanted to, the reason I wanted to show you this is that you can create your own GPT with your own documents and do the same comparisons that I actually originally built these for. So Paul, to show you some benefits, um, the client had created a whole blog series, five blogs, um, spent a lot of time on them. And what I, what I told them was, and this is back uh, last summer, is that you can create a media guide that basically takes everything in these blogs and makes a shorter version. Well, at the time they weren't very comfortable with doing so. They uh, it sold them on using GPT-4 for research and they were blown away. I did uh, multiple two hour sessions and so forth. Um, and they were really comfortable with that, but they weren't comfortable about um, using it to generate content. So what I wanted to do uh, for them was to do a comparison. Please compare these documents, All right? Just something simple. So it already knows the documents. And by the way, for my own use, uh, when I created a contract with my customer, I actually used the submission by Rosemary and a submission by another friend at the time, this wasn't available, but Claude was available. And Claude can do it, but a lot slower and a lot more process. So anyway, I think you're getting the, you know, the sense. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do is ask it, for example, what topics in AI each covered. And what they found out was that there were several AI topics in the blog series that weren't covered in the media guide which could have been covered at least in the first draft. So here's kind of a ridiculous question, all right? What animals are in a circus, right? It's not what the thing's intended for. Now think about this. Why is it answering that question? In a rag architecture, you get the null set because it isn't in there. The point of this particular question is to show you that GPT-4 in your documents are operating not in series as they do in a chat um, pipeline, but in parallel. So what GPTs do is that they determine where is the most relevant information. So in the case of a circus, there's nothing in those documents that talk about a circus, so it's going directly to um, ChatGPT. Now, as I'll show in a couple minutes, this can be extraordinarily powerful because you can imagine um, the control you have by turning off access to GPT-4, inquiring about a topic, then turn on access to your documents ask the same question of GPT-4, compare it and see how well you do. You can also do supersets 
So you tell it, go first to my documents, summarize, and then go to GPT-4 and add on. That's just one example of the level of control. So here's an example to show the trends. So what I wanna do is I wanna take part B that I've added on. And by the way, you can do these in aggregate and have a humongous set of instructions, or you can break it down, which I've done here, in sections describing explicitly what you want. And one of the benefits for doing that is, um, Adam, I'm sure you understand this, is the pause feature. When you tell a set of GPT GPUs, hey, here's a couple of spaces, here's what's coming next, right? Um, I'll get off topic for a couple of seconds because I think it's important as you, as you go beyond a beginner status. And that is, is that in the current architecture, a GPT will, GPU will spend the same amount of time on the word the as it will in a complicated, complex math equation, right? So knowing that you can't do anything about it today, if you have something that is important to you, instructions that change the flow, then you can use spaces and pause to accomplish that. So I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna go back to the blog here. I'm sorry, the GPT, and I'm gonna edit it. Go back to instructions. Hit paste, right? On the right hand side, I'm hitting save. And the space bar is in my way again. Confirm. I'll view my GPT. And then what I want to know, just to kind of show you again. What are the latest trends in using AI in public relations? Now, one of the things you heard, of course, previously is not only can't GPTs um, do web search, but they can't get links. I'll let you be the judge. So there's a whole series of things. Of course, it's not true. Here you click on it and you can you can see it brings you up to the documents there. And again, just to emphasize, I just asked for AI trends. You can get a lot more granular in the instructions as well as in the prompt. And the instructions always take precedence over the prompt. So people that claim they can do prompt injections and so forth, well, it basically tells me that they really don't know how to use it well. Now I'm gonna to go to um, a second demonstration. And before I do that, I wanna show you a document. So this document is an export of my chat dialogue since last February. February 15th was my first regular chat. This is chat classic before ChatGPT+. If you look at the bottom left, you can see that this is a small document. It's almost 4,000 pages and almost 900,000 words. Similarly, last week you were told that GPTs couldn't handle big documents. Well, let's see if they're correct, All right? Now, one thing I want you to make note of is in this document, I have the words starting a consulting practice. This was literally my first chat. You know, okay, I've been doing consulting for, you know, uh, 2011 is when I started, put a perspective for you. 
It's now 13 years, so it was 12 years back then. Why not ask ChatGPT, what is consulting? And if you look at the bottom left, I've got five pages that followed up. I just basically peppered away at trying to understand consulting in different areas. Now, why did I do that? Paul, I don't know if you remember, but I wanted to understand how ChatGPT could help me. So I wanted to understand what are all the domains of consulting in this, in the area, and then in the areas I was interested in, what does it know that I don't know? And needless to say, it's huge, right? Not surprising, but that's what really opened my eyes to the possibilities here. Now, let's get back to the, um, the document here. And again, I apologize for all the need to keep moving these uh, bars. So in one shot, if we had another half hour, I'd break these down independently, but I wanna tell you what I wanted to do here. And what you'll see a lot on LinkedIn today is all sorts of complaints. So the question you end up asking is, uh, how do you protect, how does chat GPT protect you from yourself? Um, it's a question that needs answering. What thus far OpenAI has decided to do is give you free reign to do whatever you want. You could argue that it should you know, put cement barriers around it and not allow you to do anything and you'd have to open it up. We'll see what happens because I'm sure there'll be a lot of backlash by that uh, 2% uh, that are out there um, complaining about instructions and more specifically getting access. So what I wanna do is I wanna do both. I want restriction and I want steering. And by the way, steering which I have been do doing on my own, came from a question that Manny Cortez is on the call, asked about, and I'll explain in a second. So when I, I wanna restrict responses to documents provided, i.e. do not use GPT-4. Again, I wanna use my own file. I wanna restrict access to instructions. I wanna restrict access, access to both files, the file names and the contents. And then I wanna go one step further. Okay, I have all these restrictions in place, I want to steer and focus the prompt response on a specific topic. So as you might imagine, almost 12 months or 11 months, 900,000 words, I've covered a lot of topics there. What I've decided is, um, so these are just words to what I just described. Now we'll get to focus. I want this GPT to be specifically focused about artificial intelligence and generative artificial intelligence, including products, technologies, and applications. So no circuses here, no consulting here, unless it pertains to AI or generative AI. The amount of control you have in terms of steering it and confinement is huge. It's really the limit of your imagination. So what I wanna do, is I wanna take these instructions, let me go, um, actually, I think for simplicity, I actually already did that for you, just to kind of speed things up here. So here's Bob's conversations, and we'll find out in a second whether I did it. And again, I've got to move the bar here. Of course, it's in the way of the prompt bar. Okay, here we go. What is consulting, right? This GPT is in for inquiries about AI and Gen AI only. Thank you for your understanding. You know it was in the document. I showed you that, but uh, and to the extent you understand the simple process I went of uploading, um, this is the response. Now let me be a little more specific. What in the area of Gen AI? Not the most complicated question, but nonetheless, you'll get the point.
So now let me just go to one more thing. What I'm going to provide you for resources is the following. The, the, when I, I'm going to provide a link, this entire document here in front of you. And the link includes links to several other documents. Uh, one is Ethan Mollick's document. Another for, I would say beginners, but it's a little more than beginners done by a company called Skill Leap AI. They do very good uh, introductions to topics. Um, this is what Rosemary and I used back in uh, early uh, November. I think it's a great resource. Um, the demo one that I showed you, you're going to have access to the actual document I used to demonstrate. P I call it PRAI Insight, as well as the instructions for it, as well as the website for the agency that I do consulting for, so you can see or even download for yourself the documents itself. I also uh, created another version that in two seconds, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, drop it in the chat. It's something I called uh, PRAI Insight Lockdown. It's literally the same document, except I put on the restriction controls in it. So to the extent that you have interest in, do so, in, in doing so, please hack away at it and see if you can break into either the instructions, the documents or itself, or one of the things that David Sanchez said is that he could actually create havoc, destroy the documents. What he's really talking about there is breaking into the Microsoft Azure environment. And if, of course, if he can do that, he should not only report it to OpenAI, he should report it to the author. And the reason is OpenAI customer service wants to know, know about it to work with Microsoft. Uh, I don't know that he fully realized what the comment was, but what this includes is um, the document itself to allow you to hack away. Demo two is the instructions for lockdown. I'm not gonna provide my chat dialogue for obvious reasons, but all of the lockdown instructions are there. And then finally, um, for software engineers, there's a couple of resources there. One of them is the is linked to the dev day, and the other one is to the GPTs versus a assistance API. And the reason I do that, there's also a lot of confusion out there among software engineers that aren't knowledgeable about GPTs that they think it's just assistant a APIs. And because of that, OpenAI created a blog about what the difference is. It's actually pretty clear, but... Um, so let me copy this. I'm gonna stop screen share. I'm gonna go to the chat. I'm gonna paste the link for the PRAI Insight. And uh, again, if anyone's interested in trying to break it, please do so. And I'm gonna do one more thing and then we're gonna open it up. So the one more thing is literally sharing this document here. Copy link, then go back to the chat, paste it and you'll have access to everything I just showed you. So Paul, that concludes my comments or uh, presentation. What I'd like to do uh, before we get into general questions is, is any individuals that have had experience with building a GPT uh, that would like to share their experience, you know, please do so, love to hear from you. A shy group here. Yeah, Rosemary, I'm going to call on you. You've done it. <laughs> You're not going to get away that easy. <laughs> I'm happy to do it as well. Um, I've created about five or six of them. And yeah, and it's kind of weird because I had had problems with them crawling my website using like Bing. And I've had that problem for over a month and a half. And today it seems to work just fine. So that was weird. Um, but yeah, they're they're pretty amazing. 
Hey, Donovan, what have you found it useful for? Are you just experimenting or? Um, yeah, I'm just experimenting. So what I was doing is I uploaded uh, Google's S250 page SEO guidelines document and was using that as a reference to give my website a critique, um, you know, for SEO purposes and give suggestions. It It would work just fine in the main like GPT-4 area, I could upload the PDF and then have it look. But for some reason, it wouldn't do it with the GPTs until today. But um, it's, you know, it seems to really be, what I'm seeing is a lot of people are just using it for a super single focused thing, right? Like Nicole Leffer has got a bunch of um, really focused use cases. Um, I've seen people using them for, like showrunners or different things like that. I think the the biggest problem with this is going to be tying it all into a cohesive package rather than having to try to go into all the different, you know, apps basically. And, you know, it's kind of, I feel like it's on my phone when I first started getting apps, I had a hundred apps and now I maybe use 10, right? And I think that's kind of, the space we're in right now. So it'll be interesting to see what people find most useful. Uh, Sheesh uh, had mentioned that he has built one. Maybe you can uh, describe your, your experience, Sheesh. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so hi, my name is Ashish. I've been, um, this is my first time here. So I was I probably found a link on uh, LinkedIn yesterday that the session was happening. And I thought I'll jump in and learn a little bit more. So I'll share an experience about the GPT that I created and the one that I use as well. So there is, I'll, I'll drop a link. Um, this is some very early days. I think the very first day GPTs were announced, I wanted to kind of jump in and get a sense of uh, the experience. I build this uh, prompt optimizer. I build prompts a lot uh, for work and otherwise. And I wanted to bring all the learnings that I've had with prompt, uh, a bunch of prompt guides that existed over internet uh, and pull them all in and give it to this GPT and orient it for prompt optimization. So that whenever I write something, it can help me uh, optimize my prompt, let's say. Uh, so that's what it does. Um, and more than what, what it does is I, I was intrigued by the experience of it, how it, easy it was to conversationally uh, build something. The learning that I took out from here was, I mean, prompts are are interesting. Obviously, you can steer the model from a general purpose to a specific purpose, and that orients the model to focus on that task a little bit more I've seen but what it really really what really helps the model is if you provide uh, knowledge some grounding data to it uh, whether you're uploading a pdf or uh, pointing it somewhere uh, that really helps the model because what it does otherwise is it uses world knowledge to answer a question or to respond to an ask but to by giving steering instructions and giving it specific knowledge source, uh, the model kind of um, sticks to the script a little bit more, if you know what I mean. Um, so that has been my experience. And the reason I'm saying that is I've, I've been playing around with another GPT, um, which is for uh, researching or understanding research papers. So let me drop a link to that GPT. It's not mine, it's somebody else's. Uh, but I, I found it really, really uh, useful uh, as compared to its called, da, 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 where is it? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll drop a link while, uh, when I'm done talking maybe. I think it's called auto expert or something. So what I was, what I've been doing is I, I try to research a, or read a couple of papers a week uh, around Gen AI. And I've been using GPT-4 to read up those papers. Um, and in my experience, GPT-4, uh, when you say, give me a summary, it just 
pulls a lot of the text from the abstract. Um, um, it just doesn't go into the depth and details of the subject until you are subsequently also reading the paper at the same time and asking it to deep dive into cer to certain sections, which again, for me was a cognitive overload. I have to read the paper and then point you to help me summarize. Doesn't make sense. I could just read it all the way <laughs> myself then. Uh, so this is the GPT called uh, Auto Expert and uh, Auto Expert uh, Bracket Academic. So if you uh, search for it in the store, you will find it. And that the same paper, if I upload to GPT-4 versus Auto Expert, Auto Expert produces a beautiful detailed section by section summary. And you can deep dive and understand different sections along the way. So. I, I found it really, really interesting uh, as compared to just GPT-4. So that, that's my experience. I feel GPTs will be interesting. I feel right now we're creating all these things. We don't know what their purpose is. At some point of time, when we will have agent-to-agent -agent conversation where GPTs can talk to each other or uh, whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer communication or master-slave communication, something of that sort, um, then it could be a mixture of expert where GPT-4 can hand off to another GPT to um, to respond to a task that it is in a better position to do. For example, if I had added these GPTs to my overall GPT-4, just like a plugin, and I could have asked, hey, I'm researching on this research paper, help me understand, and it can ask this GPT to do that expert role of uh, providing a GPT summary or, or a paper summary, then that, that future is more interesting for me. I'll pause and see if people have questions. So uh, uh, Ashish, thank you. Um, if you read Ethan's <coughs> paper um, or his uh, blog, he actually mentions that beginning to exhibit agent-like behavior. It's certainly uh, not there yet. I have actually a question for Lucinda um, and uh, Adam. When I put together that single slide describing what a GPT is, I was trying to think of parallels or analogies. Um, I've spent a bit of time both in the Llama Index and the um, LangChain environments, and it sort of reminded me of a no-code, low-code version of it in terms of all of its mm. capabilities. Can you see that? The only other analogy I could think of for non-technical folks might be a software a SaaS platform that actually has a lot of tentacles out there. But does that make any sense to you in terms of its capabilities? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, like for the, giving the instructions uh, and kind of shaping the kind of how the, how the, uh, how it's used in a, in a particular context is, I mean, yeah, I think that's similar to, in some senses to um, Llama Index, and Llama Index can be, it does a lot of things, right? Uh, not including those things. So I think that's, I think that's good. Um, I'm, I'm really trying to figure out like, how would I use a GPT kind of in my, in my, in my work, you know? Um, there are some things that I do that are very repetitive, but, um, I don't know. I ended up I end up researching a lot of different things because I'm always trying new things. Uh, like a project that I'm working on right now is to take a uh, job description and take the 650 resumes that we've gotten in uh, to um, to basically parse that. Do you think a GPT would be good for that? To find the most qualified candidates by giving it instructions. So off the top, I can't answer without getting down to another level of detail, you know, the, the ins, the process, and the outs, that kind of stuff. Um, sure, it is the answer. The question is, is okay, yeah. what, what are we trying to automate? And uh, is it, by creating this GPT, have you added that? Does it add value? I, I mean, I've done two to three dozen GPTs. I threw away well over half of them, you know, kind yeah. of stuff, and a lot of them. You know, you just kind of learn. It's okay. Oh, you know, it's good for this, not for that. So, um, I, could I ask uh, Carrie had her hand up? Alden, can we have yeah, uh, let Carrie uh, 
And then you could uh, go after Terry. Um, Bob, I just want to thank you. And my question is, I see the application of chat GPT, um, but how do I, since I'm teaching high school kids, how do I encourage them to use chat GPT as a tool? I feel like the workforce is changing so rapidly at this point. I don't even know how to prepare them. I teach chemistry and I feel like a lot of our generation is using Google to copy and paste. And how do I use ChatGPT as a cognitive tool? Because I could see you guys are thinking deeper and diving deeper, but I'm not seeing that in my kids. And so I, I love to, I know it's probably a long-winded question, but, but I just want to thank you for I that. Have, I have two quick responses. Well, suggestions, I should say. One is go read Ethan Mollick's um, blog series. It's called OneUsefulThing.com. Go back quite a ways. I'm talking about um, February, March, April timeframe, because he did a lot of that early on. The second one is there's a gentleman named uh, Jason uh, Gaiula, I think his name is. Carrie, why don't we connect, and I will connect with him. He is super helpful there. So there's some very strong educators on LinkedIn. They have great suggestions, read their posts and so forth, and then ask them. They're very friendly. I've connected with Jason and so forth. Alden, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, so to answer Lucinda's question, uh, GPTs can definitely be used to score resumes. That's what Lucinda essentially wants. These days, with every job posting you do, you get 800 resumes coming in. And so what Lucinda wants to do is use GPT somehow to score them. And there are ways to do it with the GPT-4 API. Uh, just not, it's not ready as yet for, you know, the, using the $20 OpenAI GPT builder you can't score as yet, but GPT-4 is definitely capable. I wrote a Medium post about it. I'll send it to, I'll send it in the chat. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Great. Bob, let's do, let's do one more question, just sensitive time. Sure. Adam had his hand up. Oh yeah, thanks. No, I have answers, not questions. Um, I was asked a couple things and I know we're over time, so I won't, I won't get too much into it, but Bob, I see the correlation to like, uh, Langchain and Llama Index. Basically, you have a tool in the middle that has large language model capabilities. It can access contents like a, a RAG, um, and it can make calls to get data from other places with an API. That's what all these things are doing in the middle. Um, I thought your slide really, really illustrated it well, though I've already DM'd you and asked for a copy of it. So I think <laughs> you're, you're definitely on the right track. Um, and Carrie, just a comment back to you. I think uh, almost a year ago, it was March last year, I, I taught a workshop on prompt craft and it was hands-on, but they actually never even used the tool. So it was all a cognitive exercise about understanding how do you craft effectively? What is it that the outcomes you're trying to achieve and really getting people to think before they use? Um, so I've DM'd you here. If you connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to share more with that about you or more about that with you. Yeah. Paul, uh, RJ has his hand up, or do you want to? Uh... No, let's let's do RJ. He can take us home, but um, <laughs> the time. Adam, thank you for sharing. Go ahead, RJ. RJ. Okay, so really quick for Carrie and also for everybody, especially beginners, use pi.ai, chat with it using your voice if you can, if you have a an iOS phone, or maybe you can do it now with an Android phone or you can use the Windows app for, that changes your dictation to text and will insert it. And you will, they will find, beginners will find amazing things in their thought process. So if they're thinking, if a student is trying to think something out, encourage them to chat with them, just like it was uh, an advisor or a coach, and they will learn more and more and more the amazing capabilities of AI. It's fan fantastic. Thank you, RJ. Um, Bob, great. Thank you for a great presentation. Everyone, thanks for joining. We'll try to keep it on time. And we'll be back here next week. And let's keep the uh, learning tray rolling here.
Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you all.